Event Horizon, the novelization of the film by Stephen E. MacDonald. Chapter 37 Miller stalked through the corridors, taking the long way around to the bridge, trying to shake off the residue of anger that lingered in his attempt to get answers from Weir. He had been furious enough to want to spack Weir silly, but had known better than to let fly. They might yet need the scientist. Jesus Christ, Miller thought, stalking. Does he have to be so goddamn useless? There was more here, though. Something he had yet to put his finger on. Weir had changed somehow. His attitude is altering, hardening. Weir was a case and a half in himself. He reached a junction, made a left turn. Don't leave me, the voice echoed along the corridors from somewhere in the distance. Miller turned, his skin crawling, trying to figure out the direction it had come from. Where are you? he shouted. His voice reverberated in the corridors, but the echoes were the only answer he received. He stepped backward, turning and stumbling over sections of piping on the floor. What do you want? he shouted. Oh God, please help me. A hollow voice, dead for these years, scream, screaming out a plea across time. Miller bent down, scooping up a short section of pipe, driven more by instinct than anything else. Get out of my fucking head, he screamed. He hurled the pipe down the corridor he was facing, heard it clang as it hit, clattering as it bounced and rolled away. Silence. There was an emptiness in his head now. Miller turned, his back against the corridor wall. He felt weak, weary. Slowly he slid down until he was sitting. He hunched up, putting his head in his hands, fighting the tears, the memories, the shame. Chapter 38 The gravity couch bay was deserted now, except for Justin floating in his tank. DJ walked in, went over to the tank, checked the readouts. They were going to have to figure out how to transfer Justin to the Lewis and Clark eventually. Miller was not planning to try to retrieve the event horizon. Any change, Miller said. DJ whirled around, surprised. Miller smiled. DJ was tough to rattle. Miller, however, had been sitting quietly in deep shadows, trying to marshal his thoughts so he could get on with the job, whatever the job had turned into. DJ walked toward him. No, no change, he said. There was a long pause. Something was troubling DJ. I've analysed his blood samples. There's no evidence of excessive levels of carbon dioxide or anything else out of the ordinary. Miller laughed, a cold, grim sound that he knew would transmit to DJ the depths of the defeat he felt. Of course not. He just climbed into the airlock because he felt like it. Just one of those things. Miller straightened up, angrily, pushing against the hopelessness. We almost lost him today. I will not lose another man. DJ raised an eyebrow, watching Miller carefully. Another man? Miller nodded. He unzipped his flight suit, slightly, reached inside, pulled out a small service medal, showed it to DJ. He had kept it with him since it had been awarded to him in a service essentially devoid of pomp and circumstance. It served as a reminder. Edmund Corrick, Miller said softly. The memories flooded in again, just as they had in the corridor. Young guy, a lot like Justin. He was with me on the Goliath. A laughing face, a smart-ass kid on the way to making a name for himself in the service. Bit on, a bit on the skinny side. Miller had considered the kid a bit of a geek, but he liked him anyway. Four of us had made it to the lifeboat. Corrick was still on board when the fire, roaring around corners, across the deck, the bulkheads, the ceiling, a living thing that melted metal and sang with a monster's voice. DJ waited, silent. Have you ever seen a fire in zero gravity? Miller went on, suddenly. It's like liquid. It slides over everything. Corrick saw the fire and froze. Just stood there, screaming. Miller swallowed, remembering, his chest hollow, screaming for me to save him. What did you do? Miller was silent, staring. Corrick, burning, screaming. It had been an oxygen fire, fast and hot, from nothing to destruction in time it took to draw a breath. Had the circumstances been slightly different, there would have been no survivors of the Goliath. Miller tried to get the words out, but it was too hard. Almost impossible. He had lived with this for too many years now. Had thought he had the grief and rage stored away somewhere else. 
He pushed against his block, determined. The truth needed to be told. The only thing I could do, he said, finally letting the images play. I shot the lifeboat hatch. I left him behind. And then the fire hit him, and he was gone. Crawling up Corrick's legs, along his arms, dripping over him like hot white rain. He could not have gone back. Those in the lifeboat would have died along with Corrick. The Board of Inquiry had commended Miller for his fort right actions in saving the others. He did not tell them the complete circumstances of Corrick's death. He had always wondered if he should have gone back, tried to retrieve Corrick. He knew they would both have died, but it did not remove the guilt. You never told me, DJ said. I never told anyone until now, Miller said softly. But this ship knew. DJ, it knows about the Goliath. It knows about Corrick. It knows our secrets. It knows what we're afraid of. It's in all our heads, and I don't know how long I can fight it. Miller slumped, frustrated, not knowing what sort of sense he was making, if any. Go ahead. Say it. I'm losing my fucking mind. DJ continued watching Miller, his gaze unshakable. Damn you, Miller thought. You should be a shrink, not a trauma, Doc. Maybe, DJ said. Maybe not. DJ's tone pulled Miller out of his misery for a moment, gave him the suggestion of hope. You know something? DJ licked his lips. He nodded towards the gravity couch bay workstation. I've... I've been listening to the transmission again. DJ walked toward the workstation. Miller stood up and followed him. And I think I made a mistake in the translation. Go on, Miller said. DJ tapped in commands, pulling up the filtered version of the recording USAC had picked up. Partway through it, as Miller's nerves were jangling from the unholy racket, DJ stopped the playback. I thought it said liberate me, DJ said slowly. Save me. But it's not me, it's liberate to Tenet. DJ glanced down at the console, up up at Miller. Save yourself. Miller tried to untense, but he could not. It's not a distress call. It's a warning. It gets worse, DJ said. Miller stared at him, saying nothing. How much worse could it get? It's very hard to make out, but listen to this final part. DJ started the recording again, and Miller's nerves tightened another notch. If they made it out of here, he was going to have nightmares for years to come. Do you hear it? Right there. Hear what? The final words. DJ hesitated for a moment, then plunged on. They sound like ex inferus. Inferus, the ablative case of inferi from hell. Save yourself from hell? Miller shook his head, trying to work all of this into something coherent. Stark's telling me this ship is alive, and now you're saying... What are you saying? The ship is possessed? DJ was shaking his head. No, I don't... I can't believe in that sort of thing. He glanced at the workstation again. But if Weir is right, this ship has passed beyond our universe, beyond reality. Who knows where it's been? What it's seen? He looked up at Miller, his expression wavering, his mask starting to slip away. And what it's brought back with it? Miller had no answer for this and could not find nothing to say that that would make any sense. The things that have happened aboard the event horizon defied reason. The intercom hissed as the circuit opened. Both Miller and DJ whirled at the sound. Captain Miller! It was Cooper. Better be good news, Cooper, Miller said. Yes, sir, Cooper replied. There was a jovial tone to his voice. We are ready to repressurize the clock and get the hell out of here. Miller could have kissed him. Chapter 39 Cooper and Smith remained on station on the hull of Lewis and Clark, keeping an eye on their patches. Miller suited up again and went down through the umbilicus into the ship, heading for the bridge. All of the systems had been powered down, conserving energy until the repairs were complete. Time to get on with it, Miller thought. He reached out and turned a manual valve, opening the surviving atmospheric tanks. All right, Cooper, he said. Crushed fingers, Cooper said. But Miller knew that was intended for Smith's benefit. Air arrived as thin mist at first falling away as the pressure increased and the air warmed up. Miller stood stock still, watching the readout of the EVA suit's exterior pressure sensor. It's holding, Smith said, 
She's holding. Calmly, a counterpoint to Smith's excitement, Cooper said, We're still... We're still venting trace gases. Give me about 20 minutes to plug the hole. You're a lifesaver, Coop, Miller said. Relief flooded him. 20 minutes. 20 minutes, he heard Smith say. We're going home. About goddamn time, Cooper said. Miller smiled, undogged his helmet, lifting it off. He took a deep breath. The air had a slight metallic tang to it, but it was nectar compared to the state of the Event Horizon's air. Back in business, Miller said to himself. His ship, his rules. The Event Horizon could go to hell. Chapter 40 They were running out of time and she was getting nowhere. Peters frowned angrily at the scientist's workstation display. Tempted to smack the thing with her fist to see if that would achieve anything. The log was stubbornly refusing to resolve into anything useful. She was tired and she hated spending her time doing this. She just wanted to get out of here and go home. She might even resign from the USAC. Try and make her way as a groundhog. Then he needed her. Rapidly, she typed in another set of instructions and smacked the enter key with more force than necessary. She stood up, stretched, not that this helped her aching back in any way, and turned to Stark, who was busy at the other side of the bridge. You got any coffee? Peter said. Stark looked around and nodded. It's cold. I don't care, she said. She went over to Stark, picked up a mug, filled it halfway. If it was intolerable, she could probably find some way of warming it up. The bridge had to have a microwave, she figured, considering how much other stuff had been crammed into it. She turned back to her workstation. To her surprise, something was actually happening with the log video. The computer was finally managing to break through the signal noise, making something of the recording. The process was rapid now. Colours blurred, changed, solidified. Images began to form. There was movement. There was... Peters felt numb, boneless. The coffee mug slipped from her fingers, shattering on the deck, coffee spilling all over her boots. Stark, she whispered. Stark turned, left her seat, stood by Peters, staring. Sweet Jesus, she said. Her voice hushed. She turned again, got to the intercom. Miller! Miller! Peters somehow found a seat, sat down heavily, stared out of the bridge windows at Neptune. She tried to empty her mind and wash away the things she had seen, but she knew that would be impossible. She closed her eyes. Tears streamed down her face. Miller stood behind Stark, watching the screen. Stark had not been particularly coherent in her message to him. But she had somehow managed to get the point across. Peters had managed to clear up the scrambled log entry. Weir and DJ had arrived just after him and now stood to either side of him. Peters was sitting in another bridge seat, not looking at the screen. She could not bear seeing the log playback. He could not believe what he was seeing. He did not know quite how to react to it other than with disgust and horror. The image on the display was flickering and rolling still, despite the best efforts of the software. As far as Miller was concerned, it was too clear. There were four of the Event Horizon's crew in the image, including Captain Kilpack. To one side of Kilpack, a crew member was somehow contorting himself impossibly. His right arm twisted, his head tilting back, his features were unrecognisable. Stark blanched and looked away. Continuing the impossible motions, the man shoved his hand into his mouth. There was a distant, wet sound. Miller could see the man's shoulder loosening, dislocating. There was blood everywhere in the image. So much blood. Beyond Kilpack, a man and woman were engaging in frantic sex. She wrapped around him as he rammed himself into her. Both of them were covered in blood. She had dug her fingernails into his back, tearing into the flesh, leaving gory tears that streamed blood down his back, though he seemed oblivious to either pain or injury. The other man had now forced a good part of his arm down his throat, more blood there streaming out of his mouth from his nose. Kilpak turned, smiling. The woman turned her head, opening her mouth. In a blur of motion, she drove her face into her partner's neck, biting down, tearing, a chunk of bleeding flesh fell and struck the deck. Blood pumped freely, spraying her, drenching his shoulder, pouring down his arm. She drove into the wound again, heedless of the blood, tearing the wound wider. His head lolled to one side, loose in death. 
yet he did not cease his maniacal thrusting. Miller wanted the turn away to shut off the playback, to end it now, but he had to know, had to see it, had to see it all, if he had any hope of ever understanding what had happened here. The man with his arm down his own throat had continued his con contortions. Miller, sickened, could not imagine what he was trying to achieve, what he was being driven to. The question was answered in a few moments later. With soft, glutinous sound, the man withdrew his arm, blood bubbled up, a torrent of it. He had grasped a handful of his innards, pulling them up, releasing them to fall wetly at his feet while he swayed, dripping blood and flesh, dead eyes staring into the distance. The woman bit again and again as her dead partner continued his thrusting. She made no move to release him or push him away. Kilpak turned. Full fathom five, thy father lies, Miller remembered. Shakespeare from high school, or, or perhaps later. The Tempest, comparing to mind as Kilpak held out his hands. Those are pearls that were his eyes. In the palms of Kilpak's hands, nestled in blood, were his eyes, held out now like an offering. Where his eyes had been, there were empty sockets lined with torn flesh. Blood oozed down over his cheeks, around his mouth, over his chin. Kilpak opened his mouth slowly, seeming almost exultant. His lips moved, forming words, in a deep, strained voice that was nothing like the one Miller had heard on earlier log entries. Kilpak said, Liberate two Tembits exit furnace. Miller could not take no more. He reached out, slapping the workstation, showing the video player back off. There was silence on the bridge. We're leaving, Miller said, his voice flat. Weir stepped in front of him, determined. We can't leave. The orders are specific. To rescue the crew and salvage the ship, Miller said, wishing Weir would get the hell out of his face, the hell out of his way, maybe just cease the bay. The crew is dead, Dr. Weir. This ship killed them. Weir was not about to be put off. We came here to do a job. We are aborting, Dr. Weir. Miller said as coldly as he could. We had watched the log playback, and he could still beg for the life of this evil ship. Take one last look around. Ignoring Weir, he turned to the others. Stark, download all the files from the Event Horizon's computers. DJ, get Justin transferred to the clock. We'll have to move the tank, DJ said. Then move the tank. DJ nodded and left the bridge, moving fast. Peters, get the CO2 scrubbers back into the clock. Weir was in his face again, his expression agonised. Don't do this. It's done, Miller snapped. He turned and walked off the bridge. Chapter 41 Weir had a death wish, Miller was sure of it. The scientist could not let things be would not let go and get on with his life. Now he was coming after Miller again, chasing him down the corridor. Miller let Weir catch up and then turned, staring at him. Without missing a beat, Weir snapped. What about my ship? We can't just leave her. I have no intention of leaving her, Miller said, using the coldest, angriest voice he could summon up. It was a voice that could cow any crew member foolish enough to cause it to be summoned. Weir didn't even flinch. I will take the Lewis and Clark to a safe distance and then launch tack missiles at the event horizon until I am satisfied that she has been vaporized. He glared at Weir for a long moment. Fuck this shit. You can't just destroy her, Weir cried. Watch me, Miller said, and he turned away from Weir, hoping that this would be the end of it. Knowing it was not, Weir lunged at Miller, grabbing hold of his flight suit and turning him around abruptly. The scientist had a savagely angry look to him. Miller lifted his arms, breaking Weir's hold on him, slamming the scientist back into the bulkhead, leaning over him. Once again, Weir was not cowed. He stared at Miller, challenging, angry, willing to fight. Miller raised a fist, willing to end it there and then, even if it meant having to patch Weir up and ship him back under medical conditions. So it would be one more thing to try and explain to Hollis. The lights went out. After a very brief pause, the emergency lighting flicked on, turning the corridor into a place of shadows. Miller, come in, Stark said over the intercom, aggravated. Miller lowered his fist and pushed Weir away from him, backing away until he found the nearest intercom panel. Stark, what the hell is going on? We lost main power again, 
Stark said, more than aggravation now. There was fear and anger in her voice. She knew as well as he did that the power losses were nothing to do with the state of the event horizon. Weir was barely visible in the darkness now, though Miller could see his eyes well enough, focused, burning with hatred. God damn it! Miller snapped, more at Weir than at Stark. Stark, get those files and vacate. I want off this ship. He backed away from the intercom. Weir was moving back into the shadows now, even his eyes fading into the gloom. Miller hated the lunatic design of the ship, hated the flying buttresses and the forks' gothic arches, casting pools of darkness everywhere under the emergency lighting. You can't leave, Weir whispered, echoing in the darkness. She won't let you. Miller walked towards the scientist, but he was having trouble seeing him now. Just get your gear. Back onto the Lewis and Clark, Doctor, or you will find yourself looking for a ride home. Weir was gone, like smoke in a breeze, vanished in the darkness. Inwardly, Miller raged, wondering how Weir could pull a stunt like this, could get away from him. I am home, Weir whispered, but it seemed as though the voice came from all around him now. The main light suddenly flared up, drenching the corridor in halogen brightness. Miller ran forward, stopped, looking around. Weir was nowhere in sight. He might as well have never been there. Where? he called. Where? No answer but echoes. He went back to the intercoms, slammed the side of his fist into it, not caring if he broke it. All hands, Dr. Weir is missing. I want him found and contained. He set off jogging in the direction he had last seen Weir, not expecting to find the scientist, intending mayhem if he did. Chapter 42 Smith had joined Peters on the event horizon, racing through the ship to retrieve all of the CO2 scrubbers they had used to try keeping the air somehow breathable. They would still be useful on the Lewis and Clark, giving them enough time to get started on the voyage back home and to get help once they were close to Daylight Station. They worked their way steadily down into the second containment. Both frustrated at the dis distribution of the cylinders, both aware that they would need almost every one of them. Spacecraft designers had not progressed far beyond their Apollo days when it came to processing atmosphere. Smith was yanking cylinders out of the wall compartment while Peters went down to retrieve the last of them. Perversely enough, the scrubber compartment had been placed directly under the core. Let's go, let's go, Smith was saying, pulling a last cylinder out, getting it boxed. This place freaks me out. You want to suffocate on the ride home? Peters called up to him. She ducked down, calling up to him. Last one! The cylinder was stubborn, refusing to come out as easily as had gone in. Come on! Smith called. God damn it! Peters growled, hauling back. The cylinder slipped free suddenly, off balancing her. She lost her grip on the scrubber, missing it as it fell into the coolant around her feet, disappearing from sight. Shit! Leave it! Smith called down. We don't have time. Let's go. The hell with it. She bent down and fished around, getting hold of the end of the cylinder, pulling it free of the muck. Not wasting time in gloating the smith, she turned around and got back up to the storage boxes. Packing the slick cylinder away, Smith had lost a cylinder in the sludge himself, but they could manage without it. They finished packing up as quickly as they could, each taking a case of the scrubbers and heading out of the second containment and into the corridor. The case was heavy and Peters found herself falling behind Smith, who lopped ahead like a man possessed. She decided she was not going to worry about it. Smith was halfway to crazy anyway, and only Miller was capable of keeping up with that man. She took a deep breath, praying that their ordeal would be over soon. There was a giggle behind her, childlike, echoing. She stopped, shocked, her heart pounded. In a whisper, she said, Danny? She turned back to look down the second containment. She could still see the call from here, a dark shape within the darkness. There was nothing else to see. She started the turn back, aware that she had lost sight of Smith. At the corner of her vision, she saw a swift movement, a tiny figure that dashed across the second containment's outer area. It couldn't be. Danny, she said again, her, vo her voice barely a even a whisper. Her head was filling with fog again. Something was wrong here. She knew that. She turned back. Smith! Smith was gone. It was more than likely halfway to the main airlock by now, unaware that she had stopped. She had to know. 
She put down the scrubber case and started back toward the second containment, looking from side to side. There was nothing to be seen. Another giggle. There was a scrape of metal upon metal. Peters crept forward, trying to see into the deep shadows. Den, she whispered. There was an open access panel in the outer area of the second containment. Peters bent down, trying to see inside. It was dark in there. The length of the duct reflecting the little light that there was. She tried to clear her mind. How could Denny have been brought here? Miller was right, she knew that. The ship used the dark corners to get to, to get at them. And here was hers, in the form of Denny. She had loved him always, and she had fled from him too, gone back to space when she should have stayed with him, stayed around to help him. Mommy? A plaintive voice so far away. She had left him behind on Earth, and this evil ship had somehow reached out and brought him here, into its dark heart. She could not allow Denny to be taken by this monster. Her son deserved a better fate than this, a better existence than the one she had afforded him. She climbed into the surface duct, ducking her head. Den, she called. She had to move along, almost crab fashion, but her determination made her quick. We had been stuck in one of these surface ducts, she remembered, cramped down and in the dark when the lights had gone out. She wondered what he had seen. She stopped at a junction, looking both ways before continuing. She wished, desperately, that she had thought to pick up a flashlight before coming in here. There was no way of knowing what else might be in here besides Danny. She had an involuntary flash of memory, the log playback cascading through her mind, and her stomach turned. She fought it, down, kept going. There was a whisper behind her. That could have been Danny's voice. She turned around, seeing nothing. There was a sound behind her at the junction, something like running feet, and she turned back again. Nothing. This time the whisper was in front of her. She eased across the junction, looking to either side again. Denny? she called, moving on. Denny, come to Mummy. She knew the ship could be playing a game with her, but she could not be certain of that. If it had somehow brought Denny here. The child laughing, amused, echoing in the distance. She continued onward, trailing it. She came to a vertical shaft. The laughter echoed down the shaft now, clear and bright. She straightened up, looking up the shaft. No choice. She began climbing the ladder, moving steadily up the shaft. The laughter was becoming clearer and clearer, the higher she climbed. Hold on, she said. Mummy's coming. Her arms and legs ached beyond belief. But she would not let the pain stop her. Not now. Not while she had a chance to save her son from the event horizon. The shaft ended at the catwalk. She pulled herself up onto the icy metal and stood up, looking around. She had no idea where she was in the ship, hoping only that she could get back to the Lewis and Clark once she had retrieved Denny. Great machinery rose on each side of her, humming with the ugly sound of harnessed energy. The machines were dark, shining dimly under low lighting. The catwalk wove between the machines, the end invisible in the gloom. Ahead of her, a small figure was running. Den? she called. The lights flickered, reddened. The low, angry hum of the machines deepened in tone, making her head hurt. She felt the sound as a pit in her stomach. She ran forward, come to a junction, turned wildly around, searching. Danny was standing a few feet away, barely visible in the dimming light. Danny, she said. He was standing. Mommy, he said. The ship had brought him here, given him this... She had no longer knew whether she should laugh or cry. All she wanted was to get out of here and make them safe. The lights flickered. She eased ahead. You can walk, she whispered, staring. Danny, you can walk. Oh, my baby. The tears were starting now. All she could think of was Danny, of getting him out. Another few steps, she could get him out. Want to show you, Mummy? Danny said, holding out his arms to her just like he had held his arms out at his birthday party. I want to show you something. Another step and she could hold on to him. The catwalk disappeared from beneath her. Screaming, she fell, plunging down. There was nothing to grab hold of, nothing to save her. She turned over in the midair, seeing the darkness of the core, then passing it, turning again. She slammed into the deck in front of the core, feeling her body bend and splinter, the pain terrible for a few moments before it faded into a general numbness. She could not move, could not feel anything. 
Her breath came raggedly, suffused with blood. Danny, she whispered. A pool of blood was spreading out from under her. Even if she was found now, she knew that nothing could be done for her. She had fallen too far, too hard. There was too much damage. She wished she could move. Twenty metres above her, she could see Danny looking down at her, clapping his hands. He giggled. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been chapters 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, and 42 of Event Horizon by Stephen E. McDonald, narrated by a patron of the channel and a good friend of mine and a subscriber, Liam Anderson. I think he's doing a great job. Sorry it's been a while since the last uploaded this book, but we are back on track now. The holidays are over, and you can expect more Event Horizon very soon. Please uh, give uh, Liam your thanks in the comments below, and we'll see you very soon with more of Event Horizon. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood slasher librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and we'll see you soon.